everyone. Just want to do a uh, sound check, make sure you can hear me on the GoToWebinar application. If you can raise your hand uh, virtually, make sure that you can hear me. Great, thank you. Welcome and thank you for joining us for cybersecurity and 889 compliance in 2021, what government contractors need to know. My name is Elizabeth Torrance and I'm the operations manager for the Virginia PTAC, we're a sponsored program of George Mason University. This procurement technical assistance center is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the Defense Logistics Agency. Here at Virginia PTAC, we offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling on government contracting topics to our Virginia-based clients. If you're based outside of Virginia, your local PTAC is also uh, going to be able to offer counseling. There's over 90 nation nationwide. You can find the link uh, to our national association and, and through that, your local office at the bottom of the Virginia PTAC uh, locations page. This website, uh, the website is aptac-us.org. If you are in Virginia and, uh, and already not, not already signed up as a client, you can do so on the eCenter or email us uh, ptac at gmu.edu with questions. In, in addition to the free counseling, we also offer a bid match subscription service to our clients who, who are interested in the aggregator. It um, emails bid opportunities matched to your keywords daily from various publicly available databases. More information on that can be found online as well. I'd encourage you to familiarize yourself with our website at virginiaptac.org, especially the resources page and blog, which have lots of valuable materials and links to supplement your counseling. Um, as you know, we also offer a wide array of weekly training opportunities, um, and we don't limit participation to just our Virginia clients. Everyone's welcome to attend our training and webinars. Before we start, just a couple housekeeping notes. We'll make the slides available to attendees. It'll be posted as a PDF on the eCenter where you signed up and attached at the bottom of the class description. You do have to be logged in to see it. Um, Leah Ramaza requested to record the training for their later internal use, but they also kindly offered to distribute a copy of the recording to webinar attendees. So be on the lookout for an email from them after the class. Let me just make sure that we are recording here. Yes, okay. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A section, not the chat box. We'll try to hold most of the questions uh, to the points that they're relevant, um, um, but um, go ahead and type them in and we'll determine whether to address them at the end or not. If you ask a question, uh, if you want to ask a question verbally, I can unmute you, uh, provided that you have a microphone. Um, just raise your hand when we get to that point and we'll uh, follow up anything we don't answer during the webinar if we run out of time. Um, hopefully we have plenty of time to cover it. And for those of you who are joining us by phone only and don't have a screen in front of you, please make sure you email us at ptac at gmu.edu to advise that you attended so we can document it. If you can see the slides on a computer or smartphone, I'll be taking attendance, so no actions needed, and they'll be accessible uh, when I mark you down. I'd like to introduce Sai Alba and Dave, Dave Schaefer from Liero Maza. Uh, Sai has been a longtime instructor at Virginia PTAC, and I'll let them tell you a little bit more about themselves on the firm. Go ahead, Sai. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody on this uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Um, happy to be here. I know this is sort of a hot topic for folks and um, probably getting more so. We've seen cybersecurity issues come up in a lot of different places, not just uh, in the, the sense of compliance for government contractors, but also when you're dealing with selling your company or taking on investors. Uh, also, just from a business perspective, some of these these things that we're going to go through are really important business practices, and I believe are going to become more important, again, not just to the federal government, but to your employees, to other non-government customers. Uh, I know it has been for us and, and our clients. Uh, it's been very important, and so we certainly have uh, gotten our own cybersecurity house in, in order. So it's uh, it's very important and we've got a lot to go through today. And I also just want to note before we get into things that we're not necessarily going to go sort of slide by slide and talk about everything in here, but we wanted, because we have like 95 slides, but we wanted to put everything out there so that people could reference it and go back to it when you get a copy of the, the slides after afterwards. So just be aware of that. Um, again, my name is Sai Alba. I'm a partner at Polaro Maza in our government contracts group. Uh, I've been doing government contracts uh, specifically and exclusively for basically my whole career for the past 17 years or so, and um, dealing with mostly small to mid-sized federal contractors. But we deal with a number of larger companies as well, and we're getting more involved with 
companies who are not really maybe traditional government contractors. And this, these cybersecurity issues tend to be a, a big deal for them. And I'm also here with my colleague, Dave Schaefer. Uh, Dave, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Sai, and thank you everyone for joining. And um, so I am Dave Schaefer. I'm an attorney with Polara Maza in our business and transactions group with a subspecialty in cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, for my background, I, I tend to counsel uh, businesses of all different sizes on a variety of different privacy protections, whether that be state, local, or federal regulatory schemes, and then cybersecurity requirements, and particularly as it relates to CMMC compliance and really how to integrate that within the rest of your business architecture and organization. And so that's really a, a main component of my practice and really I, I enjoy helping people kind of get that competitive edge and distinguish themselves in the marketplace. So I, again, really happy to be here. Um, you know, back to you, Sai. Yeah, Dave and I work together a lot with a number of different issues um, and sort of the M&A realm, especially, we do a lot together. Um, and just generally about us, and most of you, if you're in government contracting, small business stuff, you probably come across some of our stuff before, but we do a lot of work with government contractors, but even a lot more commercial businesses as well in a whole bunch of areas. In, in our business transactions, GovCon, labor and employment, or just litigation work. So, you know, across the board, if, if questions come up or people have issues. So, as to what we're going to be talking about today, there's a few broad areas that we're going to go through. First, we're going to go through CMMC, which is Dave's sort of bread and butter. Um, then we're going to talk about some of the supply chain risk management issues that have been coming up. There's sort of cyber side of that, but there's also more, more broadly general supply chain issues that I'll go through. We're also gonna talk about what some of the Biden administration is, is getting into um, at a high level because a lot of that stuff hasn't sort of concretized yet. It's, it's more of um, a wish list uh, or high level what they want to see done within the federal government and then through that pushed out into private industry and I think this was announced, you know, months and months and months ago, but with the high profile hacking that's been going on, some of the cyber breaches, I think you're, this is just going to be more of an issue for everybody. It's just going to become something that we have to get our arms around as a, a society, basically, across the world. Um, and then lastly, we're going to get into everything that we know so far dealing with Section 889 which is in the, the 2019 Defense Authorization Act, where it's all about excluding certain Chinese manufacturers from the federal contracting space. We were hoping to have some guidance out, some additional guidance out uh, this summer. It still hasn't come out yet. So, you know, kind of stay tuned, keep an eye on the 889 stuff for August, which would be two years from the enactment and one year from when the part B, which we'll get into, went into effect. So um, we'll get into that as well to kind of close things out. Okay, that being said, starting off with, you know, everybody's kind of hot topic, CMMC. And again, this is Dave's sort of specialty. So uh, take it away, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Sai. And, and I think, you know, the, the cybersecurity maturity model certification, CMMC, you know, you probably see a lot of presentations on it. You're, you're, you'll really read a lot about it. It has been going on for quite some time. And it really comes from the genesis of it is really what was taking place before CMMC and really what is the kind of architecture and infrastructure that was in place and the operations to support it. And one of the things that Sai just mentioned in his introduction there was kind of the prevalence and the ubiquitousness of just technology, right? It's really gone from, you know, a, a simple means of communication to something that's far more entwined with every aspect of our lives. You've got the internet of things and you've got interconnectivity between devices and systems as not necessarily things that are nice to have anymore, but things that are absolutely necessary. 
for you know the function of a lot a large parts of society and the department of defense is no different and so you know when the department of defense who's obviously spearheading cmmc when they took a look at kind of what was going on before cmmc this is really what they found right they found that nist the national institute of standards and technology has a special publication 800-171 so 800-171 sets forth a variety of controls and requirements and it's a guidance document right it's a special publications that's used to help inform companies of what they should be doing and so they took a look at this and they said you know we could really use this as our baseline and we can we can work with this and we're going to use this to kind of gauge how people can control and protect cui or, or controlled unclassified information and so at that point, in about 2016, you start seeing the government put, you know, certain FAR clauses and DFAR clauses into contracts to require that government contractors comply with the general terms of 800-171. And we'll talk a little bit about what that compliance used to look like, but that was kind of the basis, 110 controls and kind of taking a look at it from a very holistic perspective and really kind of one big SP, one big publication to kind of govern them all, which could be a, a little bit burdensome and was burdensome for a lot of different companies. Go ahead, Sai. And so, again, there were two main, you know, provisions. There's your FAR uh, provision that just had your basic safeguards it has to be in all solicitations, and it had 15 basic cybersecurity safeguards. And what that really was, what it took the NIST 800-171, and it, it essentially reduced it down to 15 safeguards that the idea was every company should be able to comply with this. But simultaneously, the DOD put into effect its DFARS, it's 7012. So we've got DFARS 252, 204, 7012. And that puts it in a more formal uh, position where the government contractor has to be compliant with the terms of 800-171, which included, for example, having a system security plan, or if you didn't have a full system security plan or address all of those controls, you had to have a plan of actions and milestones or a POAM in order to demonstrate how you were going to become compliant. But at the end of the day, it was really a self-certification, right? There was no independent audit. There was no real even affirmative certification. It was just another um, FAR or DFAR provision that was contained in your contracts. And so that really was lumped in with all the other, you know, EEOC and other kind of FAR and DFAR provisions. And so what happened? Well, turns out DOD, went in and investigated and found just billions upon billions of dollars of information of valuable intellectual property and contract detail and cui and foci are being lost to bad actors who were exploiting those inadequate cybersecurity protections and so a lot of people because of the self-certified self-certifying nature of the prior kind of cybersecurity framework really just had poems, but they never really got around to implementing the controls. And it left these large gaps in, in the cybersecurity posture of the DOD generally. And Sai's gonna talk later about supply chain risk management. And that really is what the DOD looked at this as and said, our supply chain is not secure. Um, and so they decided that they wanna actually make cybersecurity a true place of emphasis on these DOD acquisition vehicles. And really we want the DOD contractors to also place a significant emphasis on cybersecurity. So what's the best way to do that? To formalize the process, to make it an objective third party uh, certification. There is no self certification. There's no real getting around it. You've really got to go through the process. And by doing so there gets some comfort that if you are a government con contractor working in the DOD space, um, that you will be capable of, of protecting the CUI that comes onto your system. As you can see, we've got a variety of different frameworks that's been going on for years 
um, conceptually and then drafts of the framework. And we finally got the final version in January of last year. So as I said, it is a third party certification. So you really have to actually satisfy each one of the controls. Um, there's, it, we, they talk about cybersecurity hygiene and really what it comes down to is it's really dependent upon what level of CMMC you're going to be looking for. What is your contract or you know, what, what is it actually going to be requesting that you provide? But the idea also is that it should be, hopefully, in large part, things that businesses have already been in compliance with. And there is a lot of crosswalk between, obviously, the NIST 800-171, which forms the basis of CMMC, but also certain ISO and FedRAM prior uh, security aspects. So the idea being, hopefully these hygiene topics this maturity should already be something that people can get kind of a running start on but really it's about protecting the the dib the defense industrial basis cybersecurity posture to make things just holistically more secure yeah, and one thing i like to just add when we're talking about this is a lot of people look at these things they just see sort of dollar signs or how much this is going to cost me and um just so people are aware we, we've had probably six, seven maybe clients who in the past year have had pretty significant issues occur where somehow in multiple different ways that they're, the payments that were due to the, the client, and in one case it was like $800,000, was rerouted to bank accounts in foreign countries. And so the the large prime contractors, mostly it was it was subcontractors. The large prime contractors' systems were infiltrated, not not because the hackers went after them, the like say large contractor. It, they went after like the weak like email systems or something, and ended up getting in, ended up getting the like logins to the large contractors payment systems changed the routing numbers on the accounts so that the funds were rerouted to one was a bank in Poland and other different places rerouted them so that the funds were paid automatically to this bank account and you know within you know minutes or hours or whatever of the money hitting the bank account it was it was closed and gone um and so that's something to be aware of that this is not just like some cost center like this is this is not just to protect the government either it's to pr protect you and also your clients and, and your customers because this is going to start really impacting you yeah and i think just to to pick up on that as well you know a lot of clients will say you know my contract with the dod is for is a services contract i provide janitorial services we never touch cui we you know we don't contain any sort of sensitive information we really don't even have that great of an you know it infrastructure to to support why do i need any sort of cmmc certification and size example right there is is one of the reasons why it's about integrity over the entire supply chain and every every piece of that every piece of that kind of network really matters from a much larger perspective. And so, you know, to the second bullet on the screen here, you've got your five levels of certification, one to five. And, and we'll talk more in depth about each level, but the idea is that, you know, in that e example that I just provided, that might be a CMMC level one. Whereas somebody else who's, you know, developing, you know, the next strike fighter is going to be at a level five. So the idea, is that the level is tailorable to the contract to the needs of the government and that level and the need the means necessary to satisfy the criteria for that level will simultaneously you know correspondingly be simplified and streamlined so the idea is to make this tailorable for and not overly burdensome that we're talking about the costs 
um, shortly. So this is a business system certification comparable to CMMI. So it's essentially, it's a maturity model. There are various different tiers and categories and things that you have to demonstrate, but it will be required for all DOD contractors at the time of award of new DOD contracts, and it will be flowed down to subcontractors. Now, it's a little bit unclear right now because they're still working through the Pathfinder uh, contracts at the moment, but when we say it's gonna be flowed down, if the prime has a level five, does not mean that all of the subcontractors are also gonna have to be a level five. It, it does have to be tailorable to what is actually going to be performed on that subcontract, what impact will CUI have on your IT system, because at the end of the day, a lot of our focus is protecting CUI, right? Controlled and classified information, and it's protecting the supply chain. And so it has to be a risk analysis over what does your IT system look like? Do you have CUI? How, how likely are you to be exposed to potential bad actors? And all of that evaluated in the totality to try and determine what is the appropriate level of certification required for a particular contract and subcontract. So um, ultimately, however, at the end of the day, everybody who wants to participate in a defense industrial base is going to need CMMC. Yeah, and even if you look at like STARS-3, for instance, STARS-3, which just came out, which you know is geared towards 8A firms, which by their nature tend to be you know smaller firms, at least in the beginning. They um, are requiring at least level one at the time that well they're expecting to re require level one at the time of the first um, on ramp or the first option picks up after the first five year period. So a three year period. So it's going to be one of those things where it's it's not showing up in a bunch of these contracts right now. Like you don't see it as an absolute requirement in COSP4, or it wasn't an absolute requirement for STARS-3 or Polaris or whatever, these, these IT big GWACs that are coming out, but that's only because it doesn't exist yet. So when, once this exists, you're going to see it, as Dave said. So it's, it's something where you can't really avoid it if this is what you wanna do, and as we already talked about, it's also probably a good idea just for your business. Yeah, that's right. And I also think, you know, we've heard kind of the, the rumblings that other agencies are really looking at the DOD's rollout of CMMC and are thinking about implementing either the same or similar systems. So, you know, the DOD leads the way in a lot of cybersecurity matters. And I, I don't think it would be unreasonable uh, or surprising in the least to see other agencies implement heightened security, uh, cybersecurity standards in the future. So, you know, to the extent that you're in the DOD or thinking about it or, or, or you work in other, with other agencies, you know, cybersecurity is not going to go away. So uh, it, it's always something to kind of keep at the forefront. So as mentioned, you know, why do you, you know, what level do you need? It's a holistic analysis. There are two main buckets of information, FCI and CUI. But basically, at the end of the day, you know, the goal is to protect all of this very sensitive information to make sure that all of the resources, time, money, and intellectual property developed in the course of building out a government contract and performing work under it isn't lost to a bad actor, to an adversary, and things of that nature. So these are the five levels. And what's important to really understand is it's not so much, you know, the levels themselves, one through five, are, are somewhat self-explanatory, but the processes and the practices are two main sides of the same thing. So if you want a level three, you have to get both managed in processes and good cyber hygiene in practices. And so you know, what is kind of the difference? And the difference generally is, you know, practices. Do you have the documentation or do you have the culture? Do you have the system set up in order to have good cyber hygiene? And the next one, processes, do you actually implement that? Do you actually have a demonstrated record of, 
you know, putting those practices into practice of, of having a quarterly compliance, having those reviews, things like that. Not only do you have to demonstrate in order to attain the various levels of certification that you have these things in place, but you also have to demonstrate that you are doing them, that it is part of your organization, that your C-suite, your leadership is taking it seriously. So, you know, and a lot of times the question that we get is, okay, if I if a solicitation comes out and I need CMMC, I'll just go get it real quick. I'll go through the process. And, and that's a little short-sighted, right? Because you have to also demonstrate, not that you can't get the paperwork and the system spun up in a relatively short amount of time, though it does take a, a, a fair amount of time, but you really do have to demonstrate that this is something that you have been doing for a while, that it's integrated into your company, and, and that's kind of the process. So you've got your processes, your practices, and you've got to meet both as it relates to each level in order to satisfy the requirements to get, say, that level three certification. Okay. And these are the CMMC domains. Again, if, you, if you're familiar with the 800-171 NIST special publication, these will look generally familiar. But, you know, one of the, a few of the things I wanted to highlight, right, is that things like access control, physical protection, personnel security, there's a lot that goes into CMMC that is not purely technical, right? One of the biggest issues with cybersecurity is really the human element, and that really can't be highlighted enough. The human element, you know, inside threats, things of that nature become very important, right? So who has access to information? Why do they have access to that information? And what is their purpose? Do we have two-factor two or multi-factor authentication plans in place? Do we segregate the servers and power supplies for the physical protection and continuity of operations? You know, it's a much more comprehensive uh, kind of domain and analysis than simply just a technical piece. And the idea is to be really all-encompassing to protect that information. Now, that information may be in a digital format. However, there's a variety of different things associated with the protection of that information. And everything within each one of these domains is intended to be scalable so that small to large businesses alike can comply. Okay, so these are some of those key terms. Domains, oh, go ahead. Domains, broad categories, capabilities, practices, processes. You know, we already touched upon um, each one of those, but essentially when you look at the CMMC framework itself, it really does break it down kind of in a granular way so that you can use it as a guide to understand whether you're in compliance or not. CMMC level one, this is, as, as the slide notes, it's intended to be easily attainable, right? It's supposed to be, you know, something that's very simple to demonstrate. And you see on, this, on the bullets here, we, we put five kind of sample practices that I think really demonstrate the level of scrutiny and the level of technical uh, protections that they are looking for. Things like username and password, spam filters, antivirus software, things that I would say are relatively kind of standard in market just in, in the US right now. That's the idea. Next. Level two, obviously we're ramping up. Now we have to document these things. We have to kind of start integrating this into the culture. Um, and you start adding a few more technical pieces. You start adding the system security plan, the SSP for your company. You start kind of just building just a little bit incrementally until, next slide, level three. And level three is, this is where if you handle CUI, or FCI, this is where you're going to end up um, for the most part. This will be kind of, this is the bell curve of, of CMMC levels. This is where most people are going to end up, right? So 
it's really NIST 800-171 plus 20 additional practices. And they're taken from, you know, a variety of other different uh, cybersecurity regimes like ISO. And so this is where you start getting much more serious about your documentation. This is where you really need to have the technical chops, so to speak, to get everything nice and solidified and demonstrate that your internal systems are capable of handling and processing and protecting uh, CUI and FCI. So this is where most people are going to end up. And this is where the CMMC AB, the, the advisory board, and the assessors really focus a lot of their energy. So for the most part, to the extent that you're unaware of what you think level you might want to go towards, level three is where we, we advise people really consider um, pushing towards. And you can see here, there's some, some technical examples of of what needs to take place, what needs to be in your SSP, what needs to be in your technical system. But the big thing, again, highlighting the human element, employee training is critical, right? Because the insider threat problem accounts for a, a large percentage of cybersecurity breaches, for information breaches and things of that nature. So at this stage, employee training becomes far more important um, and making sure that, you know, what you put on an SSP and what you have from a technical perspective is great, but if none of the employees are aware of it, if they're not trained on how to implement it, if they're not trained on how to act, then it really becomes a moot point. So we're now at this level starting to really get into, okay, how do we put this, this practice into process and, and whatnot? Yeah, I don't think I've heard of an example, at least in our client base, where somebody had their systems compromised through like brute force or I don't even know if I've heard someone have their system compromised through a, an exploit like the ones that you see come out all the time like some you know zero day exploit where it was before some patch or they didn't patch it on time or something like that everyone I'm aware of whenever we traced it back it was due to um, somebody getting subjected to a phishing attack or something similar. So mm -hmm. it, it was it was an employee, it was sort of your insider threat, not being malicious, but and maybe not even being negligent because some of these things, they're getting better and better. Um, it was just somebody who hit the wrong thing at the wrong time. And, and once someone's in, they started monitoring and could worm their way to the right people up the chain and uh, you know get what they needed, which is usually money or what they wanted, which is usually money, at least in the ones we've done. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's usually a, a phishing attack. It's a password written down on a sticky note. It's something um, <clears throat> in, in which a, a, a human has kind of just given just a little bit of an opening. Um, that tends to be the, the avenue the, of least resistance for a lot of these, a lot of these vulnerabilities. Level four, now we get into level four and level five. This becomes, you know, the, the levels associated with, with contracts that have a high level of sophistication and, and potential for uh, attack, essentially. And one of the things that we've got on the screen here, you say that, you know, it, this one actually also includes, in addition to the NIST 800-171, is pieces of the 171B. And the 171B, it is a document for enhanced security requirements for critical programs and high value assets. And that really means what it says, right? High value assets, critical programs. At that point, there are additional requirements from a technical and employee human perspective, and you're going to have to satisfy that if you want to participate in those critical programs. And level five being the highest, and, and levels four and five, as you see here, advanced persistent threats. So, you know, those really sensitive programs are going to have levels four, levels five, and the DOD itself, we'll talk about kind of the inspection process, but they, the DOD itself will also be taking an active role in, in kind of reviewing these companies when they go through the certification process because of the high value associated with the the information that's going to be contained 
in those contracts, the CUI, the FCI, et cetera. So CMMC kind of, you know, where are we, where were we, where were we supposed to be? Where are we now? And so, you know, we've got the crawl, walk, run, they've got the 10 Pathfinder programs that ended up actually only being rolled out to maybe five or seven and certain program uh, officers were looking to get their contracts, to get their programs out of the Pathfinder. So it's been a, somewhat of a tumultuous rollout thus far. But the idea was to phase this out, understanding that not only does the government need to get into the process of how to evaluate CMMC entities and bake that into the already uh, already in place kind of analysis, but also companies need the opportunity to get certified to implement the, the, the policies and practices. And so you've got this phased rollout and you can see here, you've got the initial DOD estimate of total number of contracts required in CMMC. And the idea being by FY26 that all DOD contracts are gonna be CMMC required. So it's a little bit of, we're behind. I mean, I think we're gonna talk about that in the next slide. The DOD is, is, is behind in its implementation. There's a few reasons for that, but you know, they're not, meeting the phased rollout timeline thus far, but I do anticipate that it will start picking up near the later part of this year, and they're going to try to play a little bit of catch up in the next couple of years. So there is some time for the large base of DoD contracts, but it is starting to come out already. And one thing you mentioned, Dave, we guess you had a question. You mentioned that um just because the prime contract is level five or level four or something that doesn't necessarily mean that the subcontract has to be the same whose decision is that and do you know how it's going to be decided or is that still up in the air yeah it's still up in the air which is i think part of the frustration from the market right now is that there hasn't been any clear guidance on exactly how that's going to go you know the DOD has put out its FAQs associated with this, and, and given the given the roadshow talks about how, you know, that's certainly not the not the case. They don't want to put that on small businesses because I think small business would businesses would be disproportionately impacted by that requirement. But they haven't said whether they're going to leave that up to the primes and and let them leverage their own discretion and how they break up certain you know performance and and what that means. Um, or if they're going to, you know, mandate that, you know, a percentage of the subcontracts have to be level three or below. So, uh, unfortunately, the Pathfinder programs were intended to help us kind of pull out all that information, but it's really just hasn't been solidified just yet. Well, and the, and also, I guess, as a, as a secondary issue, I think people are thinking, well, look, I'm a small business. They can't. You know, there's so many different parts of the FAR and other things that are ex there where small businesses are exempted. Um, but at some point, depending on the work you're doing, that's not gonna, that's not going to matter because just because you're small and it's going to cost you a lot, it's going to increase your price or who knows, even maybe run you out of business. At some point, the work that you're doing is going could be deemed so sensitive that it's just a requirement and you have to have this. Um, at some particular level. So I think people just need to be aware, especially if you're doing work uh, at, at higher level work, or you might be someone who's key in the, in the supply chain, that you might get higher level requirements than you're kind of bargaining for. Unfortunately, we're not gonna really know until things start to really get ramped out probably in the coming years, I, I would think. Yeah, and what we've seen in the market right now is that we have seen some primes take the laboring ore and help out some of their small business subcontractors, kind of understanding the value that those relationships and those technical and uh, capabilities bring to bear on their ability to bid for contracts. So we have seen some primes help out and establish, you know, through their small business liaisons, establish CMMC assistance and even help to fund certain development. So, you know, it's certainly something that both the small businesses have in mind and also that the primes do because the smalls really make up a, a, an integral part of what the prime brings to bear as well. Okay. 
And so you can see here, you know, the DOD estimates greater than 50% will be at the level one. Um, and that is in large part because they're going to require everybody to have some sort of level. And not everybody is going to be at gaining access to CUI because not everybody has access to CUI right now. So you've got a new DFARS clause, 7021. The draft of that, uh, the interim rule came out previously, um, but the final rule was expected in May, and we put here in the dark because obviously it is well past May and we haven't seen a copy of the final rule. And so what we're hearing is that it's gonna be delayed even further. There's just so many comments that have been you know, submitted in response to the interim rule a lot of uh, organizations and trade groups are um, lobbying for certain changes. And so we're still kind of waiting to see when the actual implementing rule comes into effect. So it's a little bit of anybody's guess as to when that might be. Also, there's a question about costs mm -hmm. and how the costs are going to be recouped. I mean, I know just just generally about my my guess, but there might be more specifics on this that you know. Some of it is in your in your bids, right? Like some of this is like the cost of doing business would increase with the government to the government rather, um, which is kind of the way the 889 stuff still hasn't fully been vetted out. Because again, like this, we're waiting on the final rule, but the general understanding is that the costs are going to be borne by the contractors, but at the same time, you know, obviously like anything in the world gets passed on to the customer at some level or at some point, but maybe not directly, hey, here's a line item for this contract, here's your money for it. But um, have you heard more specific or do you know? No, I mean, I think that's, that's really it. Um, it ends up becoming a situation where it's gonna get passed through. And so you do get into that position where, you know, how much of it do you wanna, absorb and how much do you want to pass through because now you're you're talking about being competitive in the bidding process so we have the accreditation body the accreditation body is a nonprofit that was set up really to help put this whole thing together and to determine how to get these c3 paos the the cmmc third-party assessment organizations and get all of them certified. And that really creates the entire infrastructure for the actual implementation of CMMC certification. How do you actually do it? So it's really, um, you have to get certified by C3PA. And one of the things, and one of the reasons why the Pathfinder program is behind, why the rollout is behind, is that right now we have on here only two. Um, there's actually three, another one was approved just recently. But there's only three C3 PAOs who have gone through the certification and the just the sheer um, time it would take just three certifiers to go through every potential contractor in the defense industrial base is just on just that's an inconsequential. You can't even quantify how long that would take when you've got about 107, I believe, that are still waiting to be cleared by the AB so that they can go out into the market and provide those certification services. So regardless of whether they pass the 7821 and, and implement CMMC, we really don't have any C3PAOs who can go out there and certify uh, anybody right now. So there's a lag in the implementation sequencing that's causing delays kind of more holistically. I, I've seen a few other people, or we've talked to a couple of people, who have said that they're certified or that they're doing things for CMMC. And is there, do you know what they're talking about given this difference here that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, um, let me go to the next slide and kind of we could talk about provisional assessors. There are, there are registered practitioner organizations, there are provisional assessors. Essentially, Outside of the C3 PAOs, there's an entire architecture of people that help you get prepared for CMMC that can do essentially the same thing as the C3 PAO, but what they cannot do is give you the actual official certification. 
right? And so you've got provisional assessors, which are the individuals that have the technical capabilities and they've gone through the appropriate training to evaluate companies. Then you've got your registered um, participating organizations, your RPOs, that are entities that have gone through the training and have within them a variety of provisional assessors so that they can go out and help the market implement these things. And you would essentially go to these uh, companies, you would get your company, you, you get your shop all you know, nice, neat, packaged up. You go through essentially a mock process before you reach out to the C3PAO to get the actual certification. So when I talk to a lot of people and they say, I'm already certified or I'm in the process of being certified, what they're really talking about is they're talking with these professionals who are there to get you ready to go be evaluated, to go get tested, you know? So it's a little bit of some confusion because the rollout has been, you know, less than a model of clarity thus far. But when you go to the CMMC marketplace, you see a distinction between all of those various different types of bodies that can help you through the sequencing. So one of the things that uh, that was interesting to me is that the DOD really did identify, okay, so we had the NIST 800-171 self-certification process, and we identified that that wasn't working. And so we, we identified that CMMC is going to be the way to go. That's what we're going to do. But in the interim, we need something that's not as strenuous and time consuming as CMMC or costly, but we need something better than just the 7012 DFARS implementing 800-171. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make DFARS 7019 and we're gonna have SPRS, the Supplier uh, Performance Risk Assessment System. And so essentially what it is, is you go onto the system, you actually have to fill out a form, you have to rate yourself and you get scored based off of your compliance with 110 controls that are present within 800-171. You have to have an SSP and a POAM and you score yourself. And it is still you know, driven internally, but as opposed to it just being a component of a FAR provision, a DFAR provision in your contract, you have to affirmatively make a certification to the government that this is our cybersecurity's posture this is our score. So it really opens you up to be held accountable if it turns out that that score, that those certifications that you've made to the government end up not being true. So you've got to do that and you have to, you know, as it says here, keep it current. It can be good for three years unless the solicitation state otherwise. But this is really the idea of a stopgap in between the old process and then the CMMC. Um, this is kind of the timeline piece, six weeks, one to three days for CMMC level one, six weeks for the evaluation. That's for planning purposes to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And then as it relates to JVs, as you can see here, you really get into, well, what about the venturing partners? What about their systems? Unpopulated JVs, it becomes a little bit of a nuance there. So it really will include all parties. So that's always something to keep in mind when having those conversations with your with your venturing parties. You know, where are they? What's their posture? And how can you make it work? This also seems to me to be pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. Just judging on, you know, every other thing that I've ever dealt with, with government contracting stuff, um, having things done in weeks as opposed to, you know, months, it's, it's pretty... It's mm -hmm. pretty aggressive, especially with the flood they're going to get. So I, I guess. Yeah. Just... Similarly, I think that I mean this is the, this cost estimate is put out by DoD. I you know from what we're hearing in the market, and so I'm interested to hear if you've got anything different. Is that the costs associated with it are, are much more than what the DoD had originally anticipated. This is what they anticipated, but we've heard. Um, 
clients come back with with much higher costs associated with implementing the technical systems and maintaining that. And I think a lot of that is also what well, depends on where you're starting. If you're starting from a position of cybersecurity and having a really good, you know, 800-171 system in place, then the cost may be less. But if you're really starting um, from from nothing or starting obviously from a less secure position, then the costs themselves are, are going to go up uh, accordingly. Yeah, we had another question too, saying, you know, should contractors update their scores periodically? Um, I mean, I would think, I would think is as things uh, develop and progress, it's either going to be requirements of solicitations or potentially a discriminator. Or if every contract keeps going to these point systems, I could also see benefits to getting extra points if you're going through and, and updating. But um, I don't know if you have a thought on an additional thought on that. No, not really. Um, and then also there's a question about can it be used as an evaluation criteria in this interim period? I would say like li literally right now, no, I don't think so because it doesn't exist. Um, really the final rule and, and everything doesn't really exist, but I would think that starting um, maybe late, even later this year, but certainly next year, I think you will start to see it as, if not a evaluation criteria, some sort of discriminator, um, or even if it's not in there, as like a, a going beyond, like if you do see best value contracts and competitions, you'll see, you know, to get outstanding, you need to do something that exceeds the requirements and is in the best interest of the government. And that sort of best interest of the government piece leaves them a lot of discretion. But I would say if someone had a CMMC level three and it's, it's say this time next year or in 2023 or something, someone has a level three and someone has a level one, um, I could see the situation where the government would say that gives us just extra comfort even though we might not be delivering cui it's still of benefit to the government so we're going to give that person an outstanding and the person who has level one and the the rfp requires level one we're going to give that person uh just a you know satisfactory something like that i could see certainly happening okay and, and here's some recent developments you know uh, with the new administration, things are a little bit in, in flux. There are 850 comments to that interim rule they've got to process, and it, it would take roughly a year to adjudicate this. I think that the DOD really didn't necessarily anticipate the sheer volume of, of comments from the market and, and the reaction from the market, and they're a little bit on their heels and trying to make sure that, particularly with the new administration, um, they implement this right. And so we've got a little bit more congressional involvement. And so everything kind of becomes into this very gray area. Um, and again, there are no real assessors to go out there and actually give you your certification. They can assess, but not certify. And so without that infrastructure in place, you really can't implement this. Oh, I guess the question was clarified about the self-assessment scores and whether those could be used as evaluation criteria. Um, I'm not sure I've seen that yet. I, I don't know about formally using your self-assessment scores as to CMMC, but I think uh, from a broader perspective of like the way COSP4 or like OASIS um, I think Polaris is going to have self-scoring too. I could see the government putting sections in there about you have to have, um, like even though CMMC doesn't exist, like they could paraphrase, you know, that, that this is something where you can get up to 500 points if you have all these different controls and, and what your rating would be. I think it would be something more like that in the interim is probably what the way they would they would phrase it mm -hmm. 
So one of the big things here in the recent developments, as you can see on the top note, is a little bit, uh, can explain a fair amount. Katie Arrington, um, the DOD CISO, who really has been leading the charge on everything CMMC for years now, has been placed on leave. So a little bit of this is, well, the main person is no longer participating in the rollout of CMMC due to other issues. And so it's really lacking a little bit of internal leadership at the moment. So that is causing some delays to the program's rollout in addition to the new administration and the new um, the new evaluation of those 850 comments. So um, in your see here, other recent developments, we think that the prices are, are gonna go higher, um, just again, based off what we're hearing in the market and how the assessors need to be a little bit more experienced uh, than what was originally anticipated. And then, you know, the next couple of slides are just some kind of results from a, a survey for the defense industrial base. I'm not going to belabor it, but I think it echoes a lot of things that we've already talked about. And most of it really comes down to cost and how, how is that going to be baked into a company's operating budget, into its contract proposals, who's going to compensate for it, how that's going to work. And unfortunately, as, as you had mentioned previously, I don't think that we have a great answer. There's no real good, you know, comfortable answer for to address this cost piece. Um, but it is, of course, on top of everyone's mind. other other issues okay and yeah and so you know we've got some other expectations from from the industry here um but like i said when 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 the audience gets the uh the webinar which which you get after the presentation um you can you can scroll through it your picture it, yeah and i think the other thing with some of the CMMC stuff is it, this is not going to be, I don't think, this is going to be, hey, we got the final CMMC rule. Here's what it is. Great. Everyone go do what you need to do at whatever level you need to do, and we'll keep going forward. Um, because, and, and who are, or they're going to start taking more time to get the final rule out, maybe even end of this year, who knows, maybe early next. We just don't know yet because there's just been so much that has happened. I mean, even in the last six months, um, the amount of, of breaches and, and issues that we've seen uh, has just been a real, a real eye opener. I mean, not that people didn't expect it. I mean, everyone knew that this was an issue, obviously, but it's just in the public consciousness a lot more now and uh, I think you're, we're just going to see more and more pushes to get everybody, in, including the private industry, like everybody, just much more robustly protected. And that just means, you know, increased costs ac across the board, uh, not just for federal contractors, but probably for, for, for everyone. So kind of just be aware of that. Yeah. Um, and so the, the next issue then, broad, broad issue, is about supply chain risk management. And, um, you know, this goes sort of way back. But what's interesting is that back a long time ago, and even more recently, you know, probably in like the 90s and even early 2000s, when people were talking about supply chain risk management, it was a little different than what we're going to really talk about here. It was more about having multiple sources of supply and realizing that if something happened to some facility, even like a natural disaster or some, you know, war broke out and wherever you were getting your supply from, that you had multiple sources that you could draw upon in order to shore up and in, ensure that the supply chain was there in order to, to produce what you needed. Um, or also, making sure that your supply chain wasn't uh, someplace that you know, touched things that had uh, negative like social issues, like 
you know, extra pollution or, you know, slave labor or th th things of, of that nature. And that was really more of what people were talking about back then. But it's, it's sort of continued to evolve over time. And it's become more of, okay, well, where am I getting stuff from? And is that a place where I wanted to do business with? And that's always shifting sands, right? And what am I supposed to do? Well, what, what about raw materials? What about different safety recalls? What about climate changes? Am I getting some particular rare earth element or something from that, that I need from an area that's low lying and could be at risk? And is that, what, what does that mean? So that's how things have, have continued to evolve and what's been happening to make sure you're getting lowest price, but that's still shorn up and um, other issues like that. And this is just a, a list of a lot of sort of random things that have happened across the world. Um, I know we had some clients who were doing work in Afghanistan, you know, during the Afghan, the height of the Afghan war. And I, you guys probably remember when the, the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan closed down due to some drone strikes that uh, were supposedly targeting um, like Al Qaeda members, I guess at the time and hit like weddings and things of that nature. And uh, obviously major issues there and the Pakistani government shut down the border. And at that point, there were a lot of issues with supply chain risk, like actual, just again, getting stuff there and having people need, needing secondary sources if they couldn't get through the border, how are we gonna get things through and being able to ship things out and reorganize. And that continued um, and it continued on to also identifying what are just general risks and making people realize that with globalization, you get a lot more sources of supply, you can get things less expensively, you can even get things uh, faster in some cases, and you know, depending on where you are even, to put maybe a darker spin on it, there's sort of less risk of disruption in certain places um, because of the, the societies in which certain factories and things are in, like people don't take off, they don't have the opportunity, they might work six, seven days a week, and um, there's competing interests there with years ago that was probably seen as let's do this and no one knows and everyone's just going to close their eyes and cover their ears into a, a, a bigger issue but then now we're sort of moving away from we need more sources or we have you know social concerns or concerns about physical security which still exists but it's sort of being overshadowed by this idea that we don't know, we don't trust, maybe is a better way to put it, the, the sources of, of supply necessarily. And we're worried about not just the physical security of the items, but we're also worried about the cybersecurity and realizing that, well, I might be making something in the US or putting something together or um, you know, providing aftermarket things for weapon systems, let's say. I just had a client who was doing this for, um, I think it was uh, surface-to-air missiles, I think, or it was something surface-to-surface -surface maybe, like anti-tank, and it was the optics. And the optics that they were incorporating into things, really the main, they were only manufactured in, in China. And there was a lot of hemming and hawing, well, how can we do this? Can we get can we get a uh, e exemption to certain things or more broadly, even if it's completely legal, which in this particular instance it was because of the circumstances, is there risk? And there was a lot of worry about the supply chain risk there because what if there was something put in these optics that would make them, you know, you flip a switch and it makes things less accurate or it shuts them down or just more prone to failure that's the kind of thing that sort of has been seeping in into this this whole assessment is more about 
what's really in what you're buying and how do you know and how do you protect it? Um, so as part of this, DOD has really stepped up just like they did with CMMC. You know, being at, being at the federal government is the, the largest buyer of goods and services. And within that, DOD is the largest subset that they've sort of stepped up and what, and I should say for obvious reasons, they also have more worry about these sorts of things where there's actual bad actors who are manipulating products or even, even services. And there's more criticality to the, the systems that the DOD uses many times. So they're looking at this and saying, okay, well, what do we really expect people to, to do? And putting, putting out these various instructions about protection of mission critical functions and risk management and identifying critical functions and components and how that's really supposed to be, be put together. Um, but at the same time, they're saying, well, look, we, we, can't really, we can't really protect against everything our, ourselves because we don't really have authority to do this stuff. But if we take the actions we can take, just like with CMMC, things will probably trickle down. And not only that, but the idea that in, in the private sector, it's likely that this whole idea is going to continue to expand because it's just going to have to if certain things keep coming out like various breaches that we've seen in internet of things uh, proposals which i'll get into in a second and and different takeover attempts or um people making things so that they became obsolete ahead of time things of that nature that it's becoming more and more and more of an issue of, of trust and so I think looking at just general issues, if you look back in time, and this is more like, what, what was DOD doing way back? Well, in like 1980, right, DOD, they used to buy mostly custom IT products and everything now has some sort of IT component. But what was interesting is back in the 80s and, and before that, they were still probably buying custom IT, but it wasn't as widespread, right? Just because, you know, computers were less widespread. Really in the 80s, they, they really ramped up the IT systems that they had and they were buying these custom products. And when you're buying custom products, some of this stuff isn't as important because back then, everything they were buying were from sort of known federal contractors, mostly doing work in the US. And so they were looking at US contractors with US citizens doing work in the US, asking for custom software, or custom hardware products that were produced here, and just a general sense of trust that what they were getting um, were things that they, could, that they could trust. Well, as time goes by, and certainly now, they're buying mostly COTS products. Now, not across the board. You know, I still have a number of, of companies, a number of clients that do custom programming. But what's interesting is a lot of times, especially post-2008, there was a big push for cost savings, right, with sequestration and other things. And this idea that, you know, this is a very American idea, that the market knows best right? That the market will dictate what works best. And as that happens, competition is created and the, the creme de la creme rises up to the top and those products must be good. So DOD that started buying and still buy mostly these COTS products that might have some customization required, some custom programming, to either integrate or to have it used in, in a modular fashion at, at enterprise levels. But because of that, it's introduced these new security issues that DOD didn't necessarily think about in the past. And um, back to that slide where DOD said, we really don't have the authority to just straight block things. That's true in most cases. But with certain vendors, like I think the most obvious one recently was like 
Kapersky Labs, right? Where there was there was worry that um, are they secretly sort of an arm of the Russian government, or has is there the possibility at least that the Russian government could be inserting sort of back doors or uh, blind spots into some of the either antivirus and other products that Kaspersky Labs was, was using. And apparently the uh, DOD and the intelligence thought it was sufficient enough or, or risky enough that they did block Kaspersky and because they felt it was a high enough supply chain risk. That well, if if our supply chain is using this to defend their systems, at some place in that chain, it could create a risk where someone could break in, and they could di disrupt uh, the manufacture of screws for let's say the F thirty five or whatever, right? And they're disrupting the the screws, and so now we can't manufacture the jets. Now nobody hacked into the provider, like the major government contractor that's creating, you know, insert critical system here, those guys are really protected or sometimes in, in highly secretive environments, not even connected to the internet, right? Completely segregated. So if you've got that kind of system, that's hard to get into. But the guy who manufactures the screws, where if you shut down the screw manufacturer, you could shut down the development of the aircraft or the manufacturing of the aircraft in that example. That's a softer target and just as effective. And so as they've been looking at, at the, these things, they've realized that this, the, the risks are less likely to be against the contractors necessarily and more likely to be down in, in the supply chain where people aren't thinking about them as much. Um, even potentially with the janitorial services contractors, right? And well, how are you checking who's cleaning your offices? And that's, you know, I think some people would look at that, like this is kind of crazy. It's a little tinfoil hat to think that, you know, what do I have to worry about here? Is it all the way up and down the, the chain and even people that are doing services in and around the offices? But it's something that they're thinking about for sure. And you know, unlike DOD, a lot of age, a lot of companies don't have access to the type of intelligence. And so it's something that people just have to look at and do the best they can to ensure that everything is being, being protected. Um, and again, these like softer targets. Another good example with softer targets, I think, is and Dave and I were talking about this before the webinar. If you look at Target, right? When Target got hacked and, and they got in and got a bunch of information from customers, it wasn't Target that was breached, right? It was the HVAC contractor who happened to have the passwords or information to get into the Target systems because somebody must have had access to the systems in order to do their work at one point in time or or maybe even get paid and so they were given access to be able to either shut something down or move something around or whatever it happens to be and unbeknownst to or maybe somewhat unbeknownst to target they still had it they still had the information on there and somebody got in and just dumb luck most likely said hey wait Look what we just found. And in addition to that, you're also seeing things happen more broadly where, you know, the Chinese government, they think it's the Chinese government, at least, hacked uh, Microsoft. This is more recently, but hacked Microsoft and found out that in Office 365, or really the Exchange Service, so Outlook 365, in their Exchange environment, that the Chinese government was indiscriminately getting into systems, not targeting a particular system in order to get in and find something that they were looking for. Instead, they took the position that let's just get as much as we can and get into as much as we can and then sort of see what's going on while we're in there and maybe by just sheer luck or 
by just combing through everything, we'll find something eventually that's got to be interesting. Or we can find something that gives us access to something else that gives us access to something else that eventually we find to be interesting. And if we have enough uh, man hours to throw at this, we'll find something in interesting. And so that's also where DOD and other federal agencies have realized that you know, this stuff is much more important. And we've even seen it with shutting down of the pipeline, which you know, the hack more recently, they shut down the, the gas pipeline to the East Coast, didn't shut down the pipeline. It, they hacked in and basically shut down the company's ability to monitor how much fuel was going through the pipeline to stop them from charging. And like any red-blooded American company, they said, wait, if we can't bill for it, nobody gets it. And in that sort of situation, they just turned it all off because they couldn't lose money. And if they, they, that's where those sorts of issues are going to be, I think, more and more prevalent. And again, we, we just saw another hack a few weeks ago. It just nonstop. And this is just what's going to con continue happening. And uh, I also heard an interesting or read an interesting article about this situation we're in right now and being similar to where we were in the 1950s with nuclear weapons. But now we are in that same um, kind of nascent period, but as to cyber weapons and cyber warfare. And everybody sort of feeling around trying to see, well, if I test a nuclear weapon, what's the reaction of my adversary? What, what, if, what if I were to use a tactical nuclear weapon on the battlefield? Like I know the US talked about it in Korea all the time about using tactical nukes. And the issue was, well, if we use it here, the Russians have it, what if the Russians use it? And then, then are we just gonna get spun out of control and then you know, mutually assured destruction all over. And so we think that's what's going on, that you know, unless your head's in the sand, you know we do it too. The US does it all over the place. Israel's doing it, I'm sure every country has, is doing it to some extent. And everybody's sort of feeling around. And as they're doing that, they're gonna push the boundaries. And so trying to figure out how to stop that before it gets out of control is a major issue that is going on here. So to that sort of end, like GAO looked at things and found that there were 23 civilian agencies that they looked at and that none of them had implemented like the really critical SCRM practices that were recommended by the National Institute of Standard Technologies. And that in, in doing so, 14 out of 23 hadn't even started. And that there's this, this issue where as, that, as this is getting out there and GEO is making these findings, you start to see more and more and more of these very high profile attacks. And now that you've seen more of the high profile attacks that have had major impacts, shutting down systems or stopping the fuel pipeline, all these things like that, it also increases the media attention which then increases the media's desire to investigate and find more of these issues. And it's just sort of feeding off itself probably in a good way because it's drawing more attention to it and forcing people to pay attention. But at the same time, it's also going to force contractors to pay more attention and to get things up to speed. So DOE, for instance, is one of those firms or one of those agencies that uses a third party provider. And the third party provider goes through and they assess suppliers and they look through multiple risk levels, um, not just cyber, but like I said, geopolitical corruption, foreign interests, and looks at, well, how, how strong uh, a draw is it if you're in a foreign country and you're manufacturing, say, a motherboard for some particular product, what, what are those motherboards used in? and in the short term or even looking into the future and how likely is it that that could be targeted and that's the kind of level that, that doe's uh, program looks at in these these third parties and well what about combining some of these things like open source subscription federal-based information 
and all these different suppliers and what's the impact as to the agency as they're using these sorts of, of services, which is the kind of modular idea that I went through earlier that DOD uses a lot or has gotten into. And if they're using all these open source, well, what's really in there? And I've seen more agencies, especially DOD, in the licenses, if you say, hey, this is, this is my own proprietary software, uh, I'm not giving it to you without this license agreement under the, the FARS or DFARS clauses dealing with commercial software, as part of that, they always make you put something in that license agreement that talks about, are you using open source? And if you are, they want to see all the licenses. And in certain applications, I've even seen them start asking to look more carefully or asking if you've looked carefully through the code that, so that you understand which lines of code do what. And if there's anything in there that has been, that you has determined to be uh, questionable and certifying to that. Now, that's usually higher level stuff or um, things that I've seen with the intelligence agencies, but I could see that sort of idea uh, spreading. So here's just sort of eight practices kind of getting down to, well, what, what do I do? The eight practices for organizations of any size. And being able to sort of integrate your cyber SCRM across the organization, right? So that it's not just something where you're saying, well, I'm, I'm a smaller business. Um, I have this one system where it's used. I'll give myself some higher level cyber SCRM as to that. They want it to go across your organization. Because again, what if you are not protecting or you're not paying attention to the contractor that you're hiring that has nothing to do with the high level government work you're doing it's the contractor that you're hiring again like target for your hvac system and they get access to something and then they get hacked so there's you got to make it so you're protected in as many avenues as as possible and establishing a formal a formal program um, managing the critical suppliers and understanding who those suppliers are. So looking out there and rating your suppliers based on the criticality, criticality of the items you're getting from them and looking at what it is. Are they safety systems? Are they access systems? Are they key points of failure for whatever it is that you're providing? Um, is it something where you're using a third party provider that you have to give passwords to, you have to give information to and access to your systems to, that would certainly be a provider that you need to make, as a, as a critical provider, you need to make them tell you what their systems are, what are they using, how resilient are they, who are their suppliers, right? It's a key, knowing and managing the suppliers, right? Then also, if you're getting products from different suppliers, understanding not just their resiliency and accessing and sort of monitoring things throughout the supplier relationship, but where, how long have you worked with these people? Do you trust the items that they're providing you? And this is kind of an extreme example, but you could see there's a bunch of, and this was something that came out at least in the sort of tech circles that then articles that I, I can't tend to pay attention to where there were a number of one terabyte usb flash drives and even two terabyte usb flash drives that were floating around out there that were like 40 bucks well anyone who knows about these this kind of uh, hardware right knows you can't really have that that doesn't exist um you probably can't get a one terabyte drive and SSD for anywhere near that, much less uh, flash drive. Well, they were being sold on Amazon. They were on Newegg, which is a computer software. They were on um, a hardware supplier. They were on Walmart site. They were all over because so many of these websites now are not as curated as you think, which I'm sure everybody knows. You go on, you're like, wait, 
I'm buying this. Is it real? Is this something provided by Amazon or is it by some third party seller? And having to pay attention to that. Well, a lot of these flash drives were fake. They were 64 gigs, 28 gig, 128 gig hard drives or flash drives that used USB-A interfaces, which is like your standard USB interface. But what happened is they took them apart and they soldered USB-C interfaces to the opposite side and then covered it up with plastic or even some of the fancy ones were using like aluminum shells to make them look really fancy and nice. And they were soldering a USB-C interface to the other side so that when someone looked at it, if you know a little bit about computer hardware, but not a ton, you'd say, well, look, if it's got a USB-C interface, that's relatively new. It's only a few years old. So maybe it's possible that it has a one terabyte and you plugged in your computer, it would say, yep, one terabyte because Windows doesn't actually look in itself. It just relies on what the flash drive is telling it. And it was all fake. Now, most of them were just scams to get money. But in theory, they could have put something on those flash drives because they were flash drives. They did actually have some storage and work. Um, it just wasn't what they were supposed to be. And if you had somebody doing that and you weren't paying attention because you got it from a non-trusted source, that could be a really, really serious problem. And so that's just uh, an example that I've seen just in real life um, that I don't know if it's directly impacted you know, critical systems, but it certainly scammed people out of a lot of money. And if someone really wanted to be more malicious, they absolutely could. So making sure you're getting things from reputable sources and that you've trusted them, and not only that you're getting things from a, rep a reputable source, but that you're getting things from lower level sources. So who is your reputable source? Who are they sourcing from? Well, who are they sourcing? Who is the source sourcing from? And getting this idea of the entire supply chain so you understand where things are coming from and how that risk is coming into play. Because especially when you're talking about IT systems, if anywhere in the chain you've got an issue, then in theory, someone could put something into the, the system that could cause a problem. Um, and there's no clear answer as to how far you're supposed to go for these things, but the further down you go, the, the easier, the better it, it would be, obviously. Um, but at some point, it's probably not cost effective or, or possible, but you have to be able to get down in, into as low as you can. Um, a, another good example that, that we've seen is this issue of, of certain firmware that was open source used in the internet, a lot of different internet of things components because a lot of companies realized people want more and more functionality in all kinds of devices, right? Everything from toasters to refrigerators, uh, everything. And if you're not a you know major brand name, and even if you are a major brand name, more and more features means more and more money, but U.S. consumers especially are very sensitive to the price that they pay for something, including the federal government, very sensitive to the price they pay for something, less sensitive about what exactly is made, what is, what is it made of, right, or what's in it, or how long is it going to last even. People care more about price than about value a lot of times because most people don't understand value, or you can't. You can't understand value in every product you buy, right? You have to be an expert in everything. And so what happens is with these Internet of Things, people like the screens and the fancy interfaces and the different features without caring about what's in it. And so to, to get it done as cheaply as possible, there's a lot of companies who were getting TCP IP code from different places so that it was just open source. It would put the code in there instead of having to do it themselves. And that would allow all of these Internet of Things stuff to to hook up to your home network or your business network or whatever. Well, this was, there was malicious code inside here, right? And it allowed these things to then talk to your router, talk to your interfaces, 
and then get into your other systems that are much more critical than your toaster. Right? And once somebody's in, they get a back door into your system through your toaster or whatever, it's kind of a, making that up, but they could get a back door into your home network through your toaster. They then get into your computer, they put some stuff on there, they get into your banking system and away they go, right? Or they get into your, inner, your email or whatever. So that's the kind of thing where they're not even thinking about it. And it could literally be your toaster or your microwave in your office that if it is an internet capable system could compromise your entire uh, office and your entire business. So that's why these things are becoming more and more important. So again, like understanding the risk, getting some transparency, making sure you're sharing information about the risks that are discovered. I have found that most of the time the federal government is not necessarily looking to terminate you for default or start charging you a bunch of money because there's just been some hack. I mean, they're so prevalent at this point or some intrusion, they're so prevalent at this point that if you were taking the precautions required by the contract, which, I, which are going to get more stringent, um, they're not out there, but they need to know, right? And in fact, there are now a number of state laws that require you to tell customers and other providers if there's been some sort of uh, hack. Um, conducting due diligence, like I said, on lower tier subcontractors, planning for disruptions, uh, best practices, um, making sure that your plans that you have and the policies and procedures you have in place are things that you're looking at. You know, it's not just you write it and put it in a drawer. Because again, whether it's CMMC, whether it's SCRM, whether it's just your standard policies and procedures for anything, if you've done the work to put the policy together and you've written it on a piece of paper and you're not doing it, that is actually worse than never having it at all. Because if the government finds out that you're doing something and that you've certified or impliedly certified to it, and you have this fancy thing that you paid some consultant to put together and you're not doing it, that's a false claim. And so now you're looking at liability for potentially breach of contract, liability under the False Claims Act, liability under um, potentially under like wire fraud, all kinds of things. So if you take the time to put a plan together, you need to do it. And that's another thing I've seen, especially smaller businesses struggle with, is they, they want these plans because they need it. They say, well, I have to be able to provide this, and it's almost any type of plan. I've seen it for OCI mitigation plans, I've seen it for um, uh, cybersecurity plans, I've seen it for SCR, anything, right? People say, I need this plan because I need it to bid on something, and they're looking at it as a check the box item. And they ask for a consultant or they've asked us, I've put together like um, OCI plans where they say, okay, look, well, here's what we're doing. Can you just like put something together and just write it all up so it's really strong and that'll really help us get the contract and or survive a protest if we're protested. And I always say, you know, I, I could in theory take things that we've done from other people and other places and make the strongest, most amazing plan you've ever seen. But if you're not doing it, then you're lying. And that's fraud. So what I can't do is help you commit fraud. So to the extent that you don't know what you're gonna do and what you need, why don't we talk about it and talk about the types of work that you do and the types of things that you do. But at the end of the day, you need to tell me or you need to write down what's possible for you. Because if, again, if you're not following something or if you have the strictest thing in the book and you're not doing it, that's a serious problem. And if you have a breach, again, if you have a breach and you're not following the really strong plan that to implement the plan you might have wanted to implement that, it might cost a million dollars a year. Who knows, right? If you're not following it, that's a major issue. Um, at the same time, you've got to have things, right? So making sure that um, you've got plans in, in place as, as required, and a lot of these things, as CMMC starts to kick up, there's going to be overlap. 
um, again, varies from agency to agency. So there's different degrees of, of due diligence. Pay attention to your contracts. Pay attention to like more and more guidance as it, as it comes out. Um, and some of the Biden stuff I'll get into in a, a, a second. Um, again, different agencies have different authority over things and it comes down to who you're doing work for and the rules and regulations that are gonna start coming out. I know with uh, COSP4 and some of those contracts, they've, they've made issues about SCRM and, and protection and how to really get out there and make sure that what you're buying is something that um, doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. Um, so let's see what else. Other things when you're dealing with different executive orders that have come down, I think the, the Biden administration has certain other ones that are also being developed, but executive order uh, 13959 addressing threats from securities investments and financial gain companies in China. That's just, this is just an example of the types of things I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of, where they've said, look, there's a number of these companies that we think they have ties to defense or surveillance sectors. And a lot of these are targeted towards China, some potentially targeted towards uh, Russia, but China I think is, the main source of risk right now, at least according to DOD and the federal government, the main source of, of risk. And that's why even Section 89 is even more targeted at particular technologies. And we'll get into that in a, in a second as well. Um, also, the Biden administration is taking action on, on other things, right, that have nothing to do. This, this thing with uh, Xi Jinping kind of goes back to the older view. So, we need to realize that it's not just cyber and not just um, bad actors putting malicious code or malicious hardware into things. We are still there caring and the federal government wants us to care about um, certain other issues, more social issues, right? About forced labor and other, and other things that are happening or the crackdown on certain minority groups um, in, in China and trying to use some of these policies to also further the sort of social gains. So paying attention to that and, and realizing that um, it's something that is definitely gonna continue to, to pick up in these sorts of, of, of issues. Let's see, I think we have a question. I have a concern with potential conflicts of laws. If the contractor is independent contractors, the supplier risk of violating labor laws and requiring independent contractors to adhere to CMMC. Do we have any comment? Um, that's, I guess, a CMMC question. Dave, have you have you seen anything come up recently where you're requiring independent contractors and treating them as employees? When no, I mean, I haven't seen anything. I mean, I think the question goes to the FLSA's control requirement or really prohibition on, on controlling independent contractors and if they do exercise control over certain aspects of an independent contractor's performance, they could be considered W-2 employees. I mean, we haven't taken a look too deep into it. I think as an initial comment, I would likely say that I would distinguish CMMC not as telling them how to do a, or take a certain act, but more towards what is the environment or other requirements for the contract. I would think of it more similar to making sure that they have insurance requirements or that they, you know, take certain actions, but not when and how and, um, you know, precisely the process of completing any sort of specific test. So I think it's a really fact dependent question and it really goes to, you know, kind of the FLSA control requirements, not necessarily CMMC itself, but uh, unfortunately no, no solid answer on that. It's not quite a black and white. Yeah, I think it's a good point about with all of these things, it's really, I would say, contractual requirements. So when you're talking about your 1099s, they're really no different than subcontractors. Um, and so whatever the contractual agreement you have with them, making sure that you have terms in those agreements that allow for modifications to be passed down, you can limit it to like, look, if our prime does it or if the government does it, we're the prime, then 
we have the right to modify your contract commensurate with the modification that we've been given because these issues are going to keep coming up and there's gonna, I think there's going to keep being tweaks. It, it's, it's almost like the small business rules that we've seen. It seems like every year there's some change to the SBA rules through Congress or through SBA itself. And these, these little tweaks constantly are changing, constantly evolving that you have to be paying attention and sort of rolling with it. I think that's going to be the way these things keep happening. It's not like you're going to have CMMC, the final rule, and then that's it. You're locked in for a good five, 10 years. This stuff moves too rapidly that it's going to be an ongoing issue. And so being aware of it and, and moving with it is something that's going to continue to happen, which is also why some of these things about these third party service providers like, yeah, there's some risk because it's just another person that you have to trust. But at the same time, making it their responsibility to be aware of it and make sure that you're in compliance and, and up to speed is something where that can be very sort of freeing and, and helpful if you've got the right provider who understands the industry they're working in. So if you're a government contractor, that's sort of its own industry. And there's a lot of other rules and regulations that apply to it. Whereas if you're like a coal miner, right? There's a lot of rules and regulations that apply to that as well. And having some third party that assesses and keeps up to speed on things you need to change and informs you of it if you're a coal miner, that sort of even her better example maybe is just like IT security, right? Best practices with IT security for like Silicon Valley or whatever they might not have the same requirements as you as a government contractor, even if you do the same work as that Silicon Valley company. And even if the Silicon Valley company swore that this third party risk management provider is amazing, they might not, they be, might be completely unaware of the requirements uh, under the FAR DFARS or other things and aren't paying attention to those evolutions. And so you need to get the right provider as well to make sure that they're, they're paying attention to it. Um, and helping you. And again, so they help you automate things. It's a standardized approach. It can be easier. They're in constant communication, hopefully, and that they are the ones who are monitoring reporting issues to, to you. Um, be aware, though, that if you're using like a third party provider for things and something happens and it's a breach of the prime contract, let's say you're a prime contractor, it's a breach of the prime contract you have it's not enough to say, well, we didn't do it, those guys did. Because it's, you are the prime. You are the one ultimately responsible, so you still have to monitor, and you, to the extent that they're providing the service to you, having indemnification clauses and other things is critical. That being said, I don't know a lot of IT providers, whether it's cloud service providers and certainly the risk management providers, that will have an, or even do the work with the type of indemnification clause that you'd like to have. It just, there's too much risk and too much potential cost that these companies cannot provide indemnification to the level you want and, and exist. They would just cease to exist because um, there's just too much risk. Uh, now, who knows, maybe Congress will protect them. I, the, only example I can think of is like uh, gun manufacturers where there's protections for firearm manufacturers so you can't sue them for things people do with the product. There might be something like that where they say, look, you can't go after these companies for breaches of things that would otherwise uh, be appropriate in the ordinary course of, of their business or something like that because there's just so much liability or you just have to take it on all your, yourself. Um, and I, again, we already talked about sort of some of the, the pitfalls, right? If you're not vetting them or if, if you're like, well, I'm going to go to lowest, the lowest priced vendor I can possibly find, I'm not going to check into them at all. I'm like, oh, they're actually a shell company owned by the People's Republic of China, right? That would be like the worst case scenario. Um, and so that, that kind of thing you need to be aware of. Some of this stuff we've already talked about as well. So things with the Biden administration and, and what they're getting into. Um, 
these are, there's a lot going on within the Biden administration. I don't want to necessarily focus on all of uh, like a ton, a ton of these things because I want to get into 889 stuff. And a lot of this is what we've already talked about. But you just need to be aware of the fact that this is going to be a major focus. And it's not just the Biden administration that started with the Trump administration. And then with everything that's been going on in the first six months of this year, I can tell you it's going to continue to grow. And it's not going to be Biden. It's going to be whoever the heck comes after Biden and after that person, after that person. Um, this is just something that's going to be a critical issue going forward um, because there's so much risk and there's so many issues that are happening, whether it's COVID or these other supply chain issues with, you know, not just pharmaceuticals, but other things that are, that are happening. Um, it's just going to be a, a critical issue where they can't allow different, different um, uh, bad actors, state actors, other things like that, being able to get their way into our, our critical supply chains. And you might even see more push to onsource things, like these new rules on Buy American waivers, right? Where they're coming out there and they're saying, look, we need to sort of reduce these waivers. Waivers became so ubiquitous because nothing is made here, I shouldn't say that. There's, there's fewer and fewer things being made here that more and more stuff is being outsourced. And we need to cut back on that with this idea of trying to bring stuff back, um, especially in like high technology areas. And that we need to pay more attention, have more transparency as to why we're doing this. And are these things really not available domestically or are these more expensive? And if they're more expensive, maybe we should pay the higher price in order to have this, this peace of mind. Um, again, I talked about the uh, Xijiang things uh, with forced labor and whatnot and having this list of companies. I think this is something that's gonna continue to happen and we're gonna see more out there as we push uh, in a social perspective to push out. Um, obviously the new CMMC things that are, are coming out there, like we already talked about as well, and integrating more of these private sector partners to help implement things, government-wide adoptions, um, focusing on what's happening, who's being targeted, how are they getting in, and being able to assess those, those threats faster and, and more reliably. Um, uh, the main things, this is just a high level issue that is coming out with required actions by government agencies, right? Removing barriers, modernizing cybersecurity, greater transparency, which again, sharing information and greater transparency kind of goes hand in hand. Obviously, if things are classified, that can be restricted, but each agency right now seems to have their own take on things. And I know as bureaucracies get bigger and as, um, which you know, is kind of necessary when you get to a certain size, but as bureaucracies get bigger, everyone kind of sees their agency or the little section as like a fiefdom and they wanna run it the way they wanna run it. They might disagree with how someone else is running it. But what's that's created is this patchwork of different ways different people are doing things and not talking to each other. So someone might get hacked or compromised by an action and then a year later, a different agency might have the exact same thing happen to them because they're not talking to each other. So improving the way that these things are working and that people are talking to each other and people are working together is gonna be also something that, that's critical going forward. Uh, again, it's not just China, also Russia and sort of a focus on both China and Russia. Whereas, China, I think, it, I might be talking a little bit out of my area, but I think most of what they've been doing is more general um, hacking and uh, intrusion, not as sort of uh, targeted, not necessarily as monetarily focused, whereas there's a lot of Russian organizations, um, there's a lot of organized crime organizations that are more hacking for money. Um, it's also been, I think Dave and I were talking about that, like this interesting idea that should the G20 get together and just ban cryptocurrency entirely and just, just stop it, shut it down so there's no market, there's no value to it, that potentially if 
there isn't a better way to cut it off th that happening in order to shut down the sources of payment, sources of funding, make it less lucrative, um, at least for like private agencies and kind of bring it back to where it was early 2000s where you have state actors looking for state secrets and not much, much, much else. Um, let's see, the different threats, I already talked about this from, from China. Uh, again, actions with forced labor, anti-corruption, ransomware. Again, this is what I was just talking about. This, it's not just cybersecurity. It's also all these other social issues, but also these just issues of like ransomware and hacking and how to get around this. Because if we create things, if we have you know um, more ways of using like photonics or using things like that to to make to get things more secure, it's just an arms race at this point. And you're always going to have another threat to address, and then you're going to create more armor it's again to use an analogy it's like going back and looking at tank warfare in the in the 20th century right every time you had something with armor you find something armor piercing and then you had better armor and then better weapons and it's just going to keep happening like that it's been going obviously back long before <laughs> tank warfare but these things that just keep happening um and then also kind of promoting competition and getting agencies to buy more here and making sure that um more US companies are doing things to get the competition out there so no one's sort of resting on, on their laurels and everyone's looking to get the strongest protection possible and for what, what people need. Um, again, when, when you're talking about, this is more 889 stuff, which we'll get into more detail, but the FCC thinking to maybe reimburse US car carriers for removing equipment from the telecom networks, because this isn't individual federal contractors, these are things that are tied into broader and global or national systems. Um, and realizing that, again, people could be listening or certain equipment could have hardware that's embedded in it. And that we, in or, instead of taking that risk, just removing it entirely. And eventually the idea is let's focus on US or ally made equipment that we think we, we, can, we can trust. Um, again, criminal conduct and hackers and this crypto hijacking and th things like that uh, is just one of these issues that, that needs to be needs to be tackled. Um, again, this just happened too, right, with the pipeline. Well, look, every we we can't have all of these laws and all these rules that target like individual in industries. Like at some point, Congress is probably going to have to take action and generally issue rules and regulations. Um, on what people need to do work and to protect you, yourself, at least in critical infrastructure and in industries. And that's also what they're looking at. And then last, I think Biden is meeting with various, and I think Trump did this too, everybody's gonna just do this in the future. Meet with private sector industries, like, look, this cannot continue. What do we need to do? Again, this is looking to industry to say, we need to defend ourselves. And we need help in doing that. And um, we need you to step up. And then kind of lastly, moving into section 889. So for people who don't know, 889 is a section of the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act. And it was implemented through federal acquisition regulations. And there's two sections. There's part A and part B, as they're called. Part A came into effect um, right in 2019 in, in August. Part B went into effect in August of 2020. So part A, again, in effect since August 2019, it's in 52.204.25. It prohibits executive agencies from procuring or obtaining telecommunications equipment and, and services from certain prohibited Chinese manufacturers. Um, but it only applies if the if it's a deliverable, so you're something you are actually providing to the federal government, and if you're a subcontractor, same thing. If you're providing the actual item to the government, that's what Part A is about. Or if you're providing some end item to the government and the components inside of it, the substantial or essential components or critical technology to make that deliverable work. Um, if those components are from the prohibited manufacturers, it cannot be provided to the government. So the whole item or these particular components. 
you're also, <coughs> excuse me, you're also required to, within one business day, report the discovery of any uh, delivery of an item, or if you learn that components in items that you've provided to the federal government have prohibited technology, you have one day to tell the government. Or if you're sub, tell the prime if you tell the gov government. Um, again, this is a, a prime requirement though as well. So they only have one day. <laughs> so as soon as you tell them, they need to turn it around almost instantaneously. And then within 10 business days, you have to be able to dig into it and do a full reporting of what happened, how it happened, why you didn't catch it earlier, and how you're gonna fix it in the future. This applies to every agency. There's no limit on the type of contract. It's not like micro purchases, um, commercial off the shelf, it doesn't matter. It applies to everybody. It has to be flowed down. Um, we're expecting a final rule on this uh, in March, and then it was actually pushed out to August, and we still haven't seen it. So um, just kind of be aware of that. Part B is the one that, that made a bigger splash because Part B of Section 89 went into effect in August of 2020, August 13th, 2020, at least the interim rule. And it applies, again, to all federal agencies. It also applies to non-FAR agencies like FAA. So there is no exemption. It's not something just is in the FAR. It, it's in the law, so it applies to everybody. Unless a class waiver exists, it provides to all prime contractors performing any FAR covered contracts, that's the FAR clause. But generally, the law applies even to non-FAR covered contracts. Um, it applies to prime contractors only with a kind of caveat, but for right now, like really this applies to contractors only. Um, it likely does not apply to foreign affiliates, but essentially what this is, let's see if it, um, you might have skipped the actual rule. The actual rule is that it's not just providing end products. Like here, this rule is just about providing a prohibited end product or an end product that has prohibited components. What part B is about is actually using those products, prohibited products, or products that have prohibited components in any aspect of your business. And part B, that came out last year prohibited that. And so if you are a prime contractor and let's say you have a side business or let's say your kid is like, hey, I wanna make t-shirts. And you're like, great, make t-shirts, it's gonna be awesome. Or they're like a YouTuber and they have like a t-shirt store. And you're like, hey, instead of getting some third party, you know, why don't, I've got resources in my company, little Timmy or little Susie, I'll just help you and, um, will have my company will get a warehouse in China and you can store your t-shirts there and it'll just be much cheaper for you and I can write it off as a business business expense. Let's just do that. Okay, great. You got this warehouse in China for your kids t-shirt business and you have Hytera cameras in there that monitor your, your warehouse. It has nothing to do with your federal business at all. It's like it's your, your kids t-shirt company, okay? Or business. Well, because your firm has a warehouse in China and your firm is using security cameras from Hytera, which is one of the prohibited companies, that means that your business is using prohibited equipment. And under this FAR clause, you could, or this law, you could not certify that you are compliant because you helped your kid by having a warehouse under that's leased by your company using cameras, high terror cameras. Another example is, um, let's say your business is fully secure, but you have, you bought yourself a, a building to save on rent years ago. And um, because of COVID, you put high terra cameras to monitor people's um, body temperature, which is they had infrared cameras that were very popular for this purpose early in the pandemic, and they were one of the only suppliers. Well, let's say you only use them in the lobby of your building, and it just looks at people coming in just for purposes of monitoring, uh, monitoring body temperature. That's it. They have no other use in your business. It has nothing to do with your federal contract. That too is also a violation, and you would be able to certify you're not using it. Um, so it's just important to, to realize. 
in that you have to everything after August 13th, unless there's a waiver granted to the agency, not to you, because you can't, you're not really allowed to get a waiver, only the agency can. That you have to certify that you're not using any of this covered equipment in the, sort of any way whatsoever in your business at all. Um, it currently applies to affiliates and parents, it does not rather to affiliates, parents, and subsidiaries, but they took a lot of comments on this and we're not sure um, what's going to happen and we're still waiting on it like it says. There isn't any information out there yet. Also, the reporting for these things is, is ongoing. So as long as you're a federal contractor, you have to continue monitoring, continue reporting. Just like we said before, part B and A has the same rule. If you realize there's been some violation, you have one business day to report it. That's it. If you report it two business days later, it's a violation. Again, within 10 days, you've got to put together what happened, how it happened, why it happened, how you didn't find it before, why you just found it now, and how you're going to make sure that these things don't ever happen in the future. Because that is something that it, they see as being critical. There was some thought that maybe the Biden administration would walk this back, and they have not. So this is still in effect. It affects Huawei, CTE, Hytera, Hangzhou, uh, Hinkvision, uh, Dahua, and um, any of their subsidiaries and affiliates. And this is important too, anyone the Secretary of Defense reasonably believed is owned, controlled, or otherwise connected in some way to the government of the People's Republic of China. So this list can continue to grow and the Secretary of Defense can continue to put out more and more restrictions on more and more companies. Um, and it's up to you to pay attention to it. And these are some of the major Chinese manufacturers. Um, again, it, it applies to things like telecom equipment produced by Huawei or ZTE. Oh, another example I was using is you know, Huawei had pretty popular phones, like their Mate phone was a pretty popular phone um, for a number of years, maybe still is. And, um, and they're also not that expensive. So they were very popular. Let's say someone who works in your company has a Huawei phone and or they're, they use it for only personal use. That's probably okay. So if like your receptionist has a Huawei phone and he's never using it for any, any purpose, having anything related to business purely for um, non-business uses, that's probably okay. However, let's say a person has um, their email on it and you don't even know because let's say you even have a policy that people shouldn't have uh, hourly workers shouldn't have email on their phones for labor and employment purposes well they do it anyway that's something where you may not know but it could still be a violation so as soon as you find out or say you learn about it or somebody brings their phone into a meeting and they're like, hey, yeah, 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 hold on, I just got this email, I'll talk to you in a second. And you look and you see Huawei on it. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is your email on that phone? You have to inquire, you have to look. And if it, if it finds out that it is, that's a violation, you have to report it. And then you have to go through the whole explanation of how it happened, why it happened, and how you're, not gonna, how you're gonna make sure it doesn't happen in the future. Uh, telecom video equipment by Hytera, Hangzhou, and Dahua. So that's also, um, like, what, like what I said before, the thermal camera example was pretty common and actually created a lot of problems for people earlier on during the pandemic and this rule. Um, any, any telecom or video surveillance equipment that use any of the above equipment. So things that have covered vid video cameras in warehouses in China, like I said, that was like an actual example, not the necessary t-shirts, but people who had uh, facilities in China. Um, also, what, what about the use of Chinese security in local warehouses in China? And let's say you stripped out all the cameras and you only have um, like US cameras or whatever in your facility in China, none of the Chinese routers, none of the prohibited equipment, it's all being used perfectly, but you need security and you're not gonna ship people over from the US, so you hired a, a local security firm. That happened to a client. Turns out the local Chinese security firm was using um, video surveillance and communications equipment that was um, Hytera related equipment. 
And because they were using that, that was a prohibited use. You were using it in order to secure facilities for your business. That can be considered your use. Um, we're hoping that there'll be more clarity on where that line is when the final rule comes out, um, but we're still awaiting it. Um, again, the, there's different rules, different definitions. Those are all found in, in the, the FAR, but what it comes down to is covered telecommunications equipment is equipment, meaning both telecom equipment and produced by Huawei, uh, it's just ZTE, and any of their subsidiaries and affiliates or video surveillance equipment by these other companies. Services, because it's not just equipment, it's also services by any of these companies, meaning telecom, video surveillance, equipment services provided by entities using such equipment. Um, usually this is not something that's in the US, but if you're in like foreign markets, sometimes that you have to get, almost have to, get the services provided by different companies like Huawei, and that you, are, you would be prohibited from, from doing that. I've had a lot of questions from companies that do a lot of work for um, USAID, and in especially in certain countries in Africa, the Chinese government has made major investments in Africa, especially in the telecommunications market. And um, it's essentially impossible to do work in those areas and not use some of the prohibited equipment, not maybe yourself, through the networks that you're operating on, the cell networks and internet service providers. Um, that's something that USAID is aware of, and USAID actually has a, a waiver from the Director of National Intelligence for like right now. Uh, it's, I think it maybe it already expired or set to expire maybe in September. And it's one of those issues where USAID is trying to figure out what to do and trying to work with the government uh, as to how exactly they can keep providing their, their services, but that's up in the air right now as well. Another requirement is that you have to make a reasonable inquiry before you certify that you're not using this equipment or you're not selling the equipment. Now, using it, again, given the example I just gave, is more of an issue for folks because it's not just knowing what you're selling, it's what you're actually using, not in your federal contracting business, but anywhere in your business. So this inquiry has to be designed to uncover any information the entity possesses or in your possession about the producer and provider of the covered telecommunications equipment and services that you're using that includes internal and does not need to include rather internal or like third party um, audits. But that doesn't mean you can't just put your head in the sand, right? So. Most people are sitting and asking, okay, well, let's do a survey of everything we have. Is everything like Dell laptops? Okay, it's probably reasonable to assume that we're not using prohibited equipment. We don't need to take every computer apart and do a forensic analysis of the components in there. Um, and just being aware of that. And it, or if something, again, this goes to the component piece of it. Let's say you're not using any Huawei routers but you're using um, some equipment and let's say you have some reason to believe because of where you got it from or something on an invoice or something like that, that some of the equipment you just bought might have components from one of the manufacturers. If it's staring you in the face or if a reasonable inquiry would have uncovered it, that some component that's necessary for the proper function or performance of the equipment is prohibited that's something you can't ignore and you probably can't use that equipment uh, and you need to get rid of it and report it i had one company that actually had i think they spent like a hundred and something thousand on uh cameras and they had to scrap the entire system and just toss it and be because of this rule and because the rule is broad and it doesn't just apply on a contract by contract basis, it applies across the board to all federal contractors. There's a very real question as to whether or not you could actually seek money for that because there's something called the Sovereign Acts Doctrine that makes the government immune from suits for things that they do generally. So generally passing laws that are not particular to your contract, that's outside of the Contract Disputes Act, and the, the uh, government is immune from suit or from claims 
um, under that sovereign acts doctrine because it's something they did as the sovereign, not in their capacity as being someone who has privy of contract with a particular contractor. So um, that's been an issue. It's kind of waned since this first went into effect because uh, a lot of people have already seen the outcomes of these and like the cost incurred. Um, again, how do you know something's in your possession? It could be broader. Um, we were saying maybe check with third party providers if they're providing um, really, really critical systems to you. Um, if you're looking at stuff you're getting for your office or people working from home, that can also be something you need to see what people are using and actually probably should do an inventory of what people are using um, to make sure they're not using any of this prohibited equipment. In the US, it's not as much of an issue. And I checked the equipment for other clients of like major uh, third party providers like routers at Verizon or Comcast, that kind of stuff. And um, they seem to be clean. Uh, so that's okay. If you have the prohibited equipment, you know, get rid of it. What else can you do? Well, there's an example. I'm trying to see if I have it in here. Yeah, so if you look at this blanket exemption, equipment that cannot route or redirect user traffic or cannot permit visibility into the user data packets that such equipment transmit or otherwise handles is exempted from this. So that's where up here, when I say disconnected devices, so if you need cameras, and let's say you have them just connected to a local connection, they do not have any way to access the internet, which is probably unlikely at this point, but if you've connected them simply to a local system that have, goes from a computer that is not connected to the internet with a monitor that stores the footage so that the camera cannot communicate with the outside world, it does not have any capability to do that, then in theory, that is something you still have to report that was done and that you had. It would still be a reportable incident because you're using the prohibited equipment, but you could say that it's under the exemption. And so you, you should be allowed to continue using it because you have it completely cut off. Um, I kind of, I don't know if anybody is like a sci-fi nerd or whatever, but I, I consider this to be the sort of uh, Battlestar Galactica example or exemption because in that show, there was um, all of their systems were not networked with each other because the computers could hack into their networks and take over their systems. So everything was disconnected and there, there was um, a air gap between all of their systems and other systems so that no one system could be compromised and take over everything. That's exactly the issue here. If you air gap certain systems and there's no way that that can communicate out into the wider world or have access to the internet, you could be okay. But again, you still have to report it. That's also why and you could turn off the devices. You could disconnect them from a network. Um, but you can't have prohibited equipment and have it connected because of that um, exemption. The other thing I've noted is it's a required flow down, um, or it's, sorry, it's not a required flow down in its entirety, but some of it is required. So subcontractors have to swear that they're not providing under part A, they're not providing prohibited equipment to the government through you, but the subcontractors do not have to swear that they're not using the prohibited equipment in any aspect of their business. So in the examples of the receptionist with a cell phone from Huawei or high Terra cameras in your, your kid's t-shirt warehouse that have nothing to do with the government contract you're working on, that would be okay for a subcontractor. What subcontractors cannot do in the part of the thing that does need to be flowed down or they need to certify to, is they're not using it in connection with the work they are doing for the prime, because then that is tantamount to the prime using it. Again, this is an area where we're looking forward to more guidance coming out, hopefully in a month or so, but again, it could be pushed back, giving us more information about um, what is required. Uh, also, 
the requirement that things be reported if there is a violation that is is a required flow down and so they need to report it again within one business day they have to report it to the prime the prime then has that one business day to report it up to the government so it's very um, short the short period of time where they have to to require it and the reporting and the 10-day stronger report or more in-depth report also applies to subcontractors, so they also have to provide it. We talked about the blanket exception, and then there's also the government exception. So connection to third-party providers like backhaul, roaming, interconnects, um, that is the government's exception, so the government doesn't have to worry about it if they are, if they are connecting. And um, this also does not apply to contractors under the use of Part B section. Uh, and at least that's where USAID and other agencies have also started to say, well, look, if there's no way to really know and you're just connecting through the internet to Verizon and Verizon is using Huawei systems somewhere in their infrastructure that you don't even know about or things are being bounced around through different like VPNs or something and you're hitting some uh, backhaul that is through like Huawei or something. You can't really know that. Uh, we're, again, though, we're looking for more guidance on this when the final rule comes out. The last part of this is, is waivers. So the waiver piece of this is very strict and it's serious, right? It's, it's a major issue to get a waiver here. It's not something you just ask your contracting officer to give you. They don't have authority for that. The agency head can grant a one-time waiver to a particular government agency, but the agent, this is the whole agency, right? Not one little subsection. The agency head has to provide compelling justification as to why the waiver is necessary and a full and complete lay on or description of the equipment or services that are being used, why they can't switch it, and what's the plan to get rid of it as quickly as possible. The idea here was that agencies would be put on notice and within the, the year to like this month or August, they would be stripping this out of everything. And the waiver would only be granted for that limited purpose. Um, or if there's sort of some national emergency like a hurricane or something like that happens and you, you need equipment fast to get in, save lives, you might be able to get, the agency could do a waiver for that as well. They have to uh, notify the Director of National Intelligence and then within 30 days provide a full description of everything of each prohibited technology being used. And that has to be submitted to Congress with an attestation of why the waiver does not risk national security. So again, this is not a simple process. They have to go through the Director of National Intelligence and they have to go to Congress and report it so that Congress can rake them over the coals if they want to as to why they're still using this equipment. Um, the Director of National Intelligence also has the authority to provide their own waiver, but only if they determine that the waiver is in the national security interest of the United States. DOD's waiver um, it, for this particular purpose expired. Um, I thought that might have been re-upped, uh, but it's one of those things where Part B, even though everyone knew it was coming for two and a half years, um, or actually one and a half years, in one and a half years, they knew it was coming because the National Defense Authorization Act was passed in January of 2019. Most people were not paying attention and were caught off guard. Uh, and so you, you saw a lot of agencies and everyone saying, well, wait a minute, we need a waiver for this. And uh, there wasn't a lot of appetite for that because a lot of people thought that uh, it, the it should have been known, and DOD especially thought that it should have been known, and agencies and contractors should have been preparing for a year and a half. So if you submit something, if you submit an offer that does not comply with the rule, the contracting officer has to then look at that and say, all right, do I want to go to the head of my entire agency and ask them to go through this entire process of putting together compelling uh, compelling justification, why, how we're gonna phase it out, ask for permission from the Director of National Intelligence, and then tell on us to Congress, do I really wanna go through that? Or 
is it not worth it, right? And if it's an ongoing contract and the contractor can't comply, they might seek a waiver. But again, they got to do that whole process. They can't just say themselves. The agency has to do it. Or they just terminate the contract. Um, no option years are allowed under the law. If there's non-compliance, they're supposed to terminate immediately or terminate the option year. Again, there's only those two types of waivers, the director of national intelligence or the agency head, and they're both really complicated. In practice, there has been seemingly waivers granted and they are getting extended. So <clears throat> while we thought this would be much more difficult, there does seem to be some flexibility here, just given how onerous this has been. Um, but I don't think it's going to last much longer once that final rule comes out. And another thing people have said is this is going to hurt everybody. It's going to hurt small businesses. It's going to hurt a lot of different companies. Well, the FAR Council looked at that and they said, yep, you're right. 74% of companies are going to be impacted. It's going to really harm small businesses. It's going to be a significant cost impact. It, they said, look, a lot of companies are probably just going to quit. They're going to leave the federal marketplace altogether. And there's going to be a ton of claims with companies saying, well, this is costing us more. We need to increase the cost of our contract. Um, there's, there's no inventory in certain places around the world. We have to use this equipment. All of that was recognized and understood. And they said, we don't care. This is too critical. The word on the street is that it has, it has something to do with the classified information that we don't necessarily know about, but I guess you can probably guess that China has embedded certain uh, sort of, what do you want to call it, spyware or, or firmware that does packet sniffing and other things like that. There might have already been an infiltration in certain sectors and they're trying to clean that out. That's one way. A more cynical way to look at it was that people thought that this was merely a, a roundabout way of entering into a trade war with China without being so explicit. Whichever it is, the rule is here and it's here to stay. There's no indication that's going to be backed off. Um, again, it applies to all parts of the company. Like I said, if you have locations in China or other where there hasn't been any clear exemption for that. Um, but what if there's no other option? Who knows? We have seen some sort of tit for tat laws requiring China's use of equipment. Um, in fact, you probably heard that China has a plan to eliminate all foreign processors, CPUs, by I think 2025. And they're really ramping up their own development of internal IP, some of which people think was stolen from US manufacturers because most of the processors around the world are either Intel or AMD which are both, China, both um, US companies. There's also been some talk about, well, what if, what if China tries to invade Taiwan or secure Taiwan because um, one of the major uh, fabrication labs for uh, CPUs or, or processors of all types uh, is TSMC, and that could be a major issue. <laughs> so thinking about sort of bringing more stuff here. In fact, Intel that used to uh, do the fabrication for most of its chips is having problems, as you've also probably heard, and they're thinking about outsourcing to TSMC in, in Taiwan, and uh, that is also a risk. So that's another place where the Biden administration is really pushing, especially because of the, the shortages for COVID, but also this, do we need to bring more stuff back? Is there other places where we could create things? Um, if you have current bids, it's now been a year. And so, again, we were hoping to have the final rule, but it's not out yet about what to do. But you are supposed to have already made a reasonable inquiry. Um, this rule has already been in effect for a while now. And so has the FAR rules, where you have to really, hopefully, you've already purged your company of these uses. But if you're a new organization, realize you have to do that. You have to make sure you're not using it in any aspect of your business if you're a prime contractor, and if you're a subcontractor that you're not using it for any goods or services you're providing under the contract. Um, and if you're looking at awarding subcontracts to contractors and they cannot certify that they're not using it, you should not award that subcontract. You should go to another party. Because um, again, this, this is a, a critical issue. 
if you are providing things and you're not paying attention to it and you are um, either putting your head in the sand or you're not doing that reasonable inquiry appropriately, you could have false claim act sort of ramifications. What is a reasonable inquiry? Again, that's not entirely clear. Um, and we were hoping for more guidance. I went through the definition earlier, but the, even the definition is vague. Um, so as soon as this extra guidance comes out, I'm sure we'll put out more information as to what exactly people need to do and what it means for companies here and globally. Uh, again, ignoring red flags is a problem because the False Claim Act liability is if you do something willfully or knowingly, or if you do something with reckless disregard for the truth. So if you had a situation where you learned that certain components in, say, your computer systems or your routers contained the prohibited equipment and you ignored it, that is a major problem. Um, and if you also limit the employee's ability to report use, that can be a serious problem because then you not only have FCA issues, you might have whistleblower issues on top of it and um, uh, violating whistleblower protection laws. So that's all negative issues. Um, GSA issued a class deviation requiring representations to whether the contractor will use or will not provide covered equipment or services. This extends a requirement to leases. And also there's the FAR clause that was included. So again, the government is broadening while it already applied because of the way the law was written. A lot of, of contracting officers and people within the federal government sometimes look only to the FAR. And so there was a, a big push to include this in the FAR clause and to make sure that it was broadened out to everyone so that it was clear that they were serious and that these things um, applied. So that's kind of quickly, I know we went through things, we had a lot of stuff to go through and um, went through as quickly as, as we could. But if there's any additional questions or issues, that's the contact information for Dave and I. Email's probably best right now, uh, given that we're sort of in and out of the office, depending on what's going on. Um, still mostly probably remote at this point. Um, and there was a question about the best place to obtain the current listing and frequently updated list of the banned equipment. I have to double check. Last I looked, which is a while ago, there wasn't actually a list that was being kept up. In fact, I don't know if there is one. If someone knows of one, uh, let me know, but I'll, I'll take a look as well. Because the issue was that companies keep making more and more like new products or different products, and the government didn't want to take the time to actually try to figure out what sort of, sort of third party products that might not be under these brand names or under the brand names of any affiliates that might have components from these prohibited uh, companies. And so instead they left it up to contractors to do it themselves and to figure it out. Um, and also, a lot of these Chinese companies create different subsidiaries in order to try to get around name recognition or brand recognition. And so the, again, the government didn't want to have to worry about that and put it all on you. Um, I have not yet seen any major implications from this. I have not seen the government have any False Claim Act um, cases yet. Now, granted, it's been too soon. Most FCA investigations take years to to unwind or to happen. So there might be in the future, uh, especially once the final rule drops, I think that'll give a little bit more guidance to things and uh, maybe even lighten this up. But if what I'm hearing is accurate, that the, the intelligence folks think that this is a critical vulnerability, they might not lighten it up. And it might just, we might just get more guidance on the inquiry you have to perform and that side of things so then you can know well did i have to take every computer apart in my entire office did i have to look at every single cell phone brand and make and model that people are using in my office and do a deep dive on every component and subcomponent in there i don't think that's going to be the case 
but it's something that uh, we hope to find more about. I was really hoping it'd be out by now, but maybe next month, um, which would be the one year anniversary of part B to try to get more detail. And as soon as we know more, we'll put things out there. Um, so I guess thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. I don't know if Dave, you had anything else? No, just thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. We're happy to help. Thanks, Sai. Uh, Thanks, David. Really appreciate your time. Until next time. <laughs>